Welcome to Divorce is Not a Destination. I'm Dr. Lisa Summerauer, a breakup and divorce strategist. If you've experienced a breakup or a divorce, you already know how stressful it can be. But here's the thing, divorce isn't the end of your story. It's a new beginning starting from where you are right now. So join me for a unique blend of humor and straight talk as we navigate the ups and downs, drama and trauma, and emotional roller coaster ride experienced when a relationship ends. You won't be alone. I'll introduce you to guests who share their experiences and success stories. Come here for actionable tips, tools, and strategies that empower you to move forward. Whether you need healing, guidance, or a fresh perspective, I'm here to remind you it's your life, your journey. Here on Divorce is Not a Destination. Well, good evening, good evening. It is 5.15 and we are starting, we are starting on time. I am just glad to be here. Everybody knows I was gone for over a month. We were on vacation traveling and then... um, I got back and just trying to get back in the saddle again. So this is actually week two. I'm calling this season three, week two of season three. And happy to be here. And thank you to everybody who is able to get here live. Hey, Nadine. Hey, Mom. Oh, I haven't seen Nadine in a minute. I just almost text you. Um, uh, Happy to see the people that are able to join me live. And I'm really happy about the people who are catching the show in replays here on Fireside and on streaming services. My girlfriend is visiting me, and today she actually listened to me on Spotify, and I was just so excited. I know it's on there, but it's just something when somebody actually tells you, I was listening to you on Spotify today. And so let your friends know that you can catch Divorce is Not a Destination on one of your favorite streaming channels. It's on all of the major ones um, and a few that I've never heard of, but I know that they're on there. So welcome to today's show. It's it's a Thursday night and this is our time for Divorce is Not a Destination. I'm Dr. Lisa, Dr. Lisa Summer Hour, and I do this podcast to give people a chance to come and share their own experiences, their own information. I'm actually um, a coach. I do work in corporate America and higher education, and I'm also a, an accredited breakup and divorce coach. And I work with women who are in high profile positions who are going through dealing with breakups or divorces. They're still dealing with the trauma or drama associated with their breakup and divorce. And I know that they're looking for confidentiality and some type of community support as they go through it. And I work with them on a couple of things, but I focus on four areas. One is accountability, learning how to create accountability in your life so you can own as much as you can. The other thing is alignment, so you can create alignment between your faith and your values. And then it's communication, learning how to communicate with confidence and without guilt, because a lot of people, and I, since I work mostly with women, you're going to hear me, hey, Angel, you're going to hear me say women, but it's women and a few exceptional men. Uh, or extra extraordinary men, but I work with on communication because for a lot of, of us, and I'll say I'll include myself because I've been there as well. We struggle with communicating without feeling guilty, and so I want to teach and help women learn how to communicate effectively with confidence, with no guilt attached to it. And then the fourth thing that I focus on is trust, and it starts with yourself, learning how to trust yourself so that you feel comfortable enough to trust other people. So those are the areas that I work with my clients on. Here, we interject that in a little and a little bit more. Those of you who are with me regularly know that we come in here and it's education, information, and some fun and laughter whenever it fits in. And I always open the microphone and the stage up to anybody else who wants to share. And usually we've got some folks who do want to share. So I thank you for that. Um, and I'm just going to do a little techno help here because they are changing. Uh, Fireside is often changing the configuration of things. So if you are on your screen now and the way that you want to invite or be invited to get on stage, there are three dots over in the, I, I hope it's all the same on everybody's phone, in the lower right of your screen, you'll see those little dots. And if you click on those, that's one way that you can request to be invited to the screen or to the conversation. The other way, I think if you hit your little icon, you may also see that information on asking to talk. You can raise your hand and ask to talk. And the other little buttons in the lower right, you'll see all those little icons. If you want to cheer or yell or put a heart up or clap or high five, you can do all of that with those icons too. 
So today I want to talk about five ways to help you move on after a breakup. And although I deal a lot with divorce, it's really any kind of breakup because we all know some of us have been through breakups uh, and relationships where we weren't married that have been more trying and more traumatic and more difficult to get over than, than some of the, the marriages that we might have had. So um, it's either the breakup or divorce or both. And it's to help you just keep your wits about you or regain clarity around that divorce or that breakup so that you can enjoy your life, you know, so that you can enjoy your life and you don't spend more time than is necessary lamenting over something that is actually over. So we know that despite everything that we might do uh, to try to keep the relationship intact, it doesn't always work out that way. And so I'm going to go through like five things and then I always have a few little bonus. I'm going to call them Dr. Lisa add-ons, I think, for this one. I always have a, a couple of bonus ones and I always get some extra stuff from those of you in the audience who are listening. So if you are hearing something or if you hear something, do me a favor and write it down because I'm going to take a couple of breaks throughout the show and give you a chance to chime in. So if something really speaks to you, uh, try to write it down on something so you can remember or just raise your hand and I'll try to take a pause and get you in, in, in real time. So the first thing I want you to think about, and for those of you, I don't know if anybody on here, let's see, I don't know if anybody right now is going through a breakup, but you may have a friend who is going through a breakup. It may not apply to you right now. Think about relationships from your past. Hey, Monica, think about relationships from your past and think about friends that are either going through something now or if they do, these are some tips that you might want to share with them to help them. So the first thing is to take some time and really think about what has happened to you. Very often, we will get out of one relationship. I just had um, I had a group session I was on yesterday with a group of women, and one of them was talking about just beautiful young woman, really, really vulnerable and being honest about what she had experienced. And she was saying her last three relationships, serious relationships, all happened one behind the one, the next behind the next. They just came. She said, I didn't give myself any time to process what had happened and to process the experience and how she had gotten into the relationship or why the relationship might have ended. So the first thing I'm going to recommend if you are, are experiencing a breakup is take the time that you need to ponder what has happened, to think about it, um, and to figure out how, how, what is your coping mechanism? How do you cope with things at the end of a relationship? So one of the areas under this one, under taking time, is to get clarity. Now, the importance of getting clarity is clarity is another way for you to empower yourself. When you can get clear about what happened and start trying to contemplate why these things might have happened, especially if it's a repeat relationship or a repeat behavior pattern that has let you into another relationship. Get clear about what happened. One of the things you can do to get clarity, especially if it has ended and it's really difficult for you, is understand something that we call the loss cycle. Now, the loss cycle is very, very similar to the grief cycle. And the interesting thing about a divorce and the, the research on this is around the stress. It's a stress inventory um, about divorce and where divorce fits on a stress inventory. The only thing more stressful than a divorce is the death of a spouse. And I'm going to say divorce. And again, I'm also going to include breakups because like I said, breakups can be just as troubling, even if you didn't get married, it can be just as traumatic. So the reason the loss cycle and understanding it is important is because the similar, the things that you have in common or that these two incidents have in common, a divorce or a death is this loss cycle or with death, they refer to it as the grief cycle. And for most people, they look at five different areas when they're looking at the loss cycle or the grief cycle. And that's denial. You go into a state of denial. So you're sort of in a state of shock. The next one would be anger. And then there's this area called, they call bargaining. It's sort of like the period when you or your partner says, I'll, I'll try anything. I'll go to counseling or I'll stop doing this. It's literally could be this bargaining thing that you throw into the relationship to try to save it. Um, then it's depression and then acceptance. So um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. Now, the thing to understand about this loss cycle is these things don't necessarily have to happen in that order. That's number one. 
Uh, you could be, you could go through this cycle for a couple of months. They tell you it could go on for a year or more. You could be, and it doesn't mean that you can't function. It doesn't mean you're not going to be able to go to work or you're not going to, but you may have certain parts of that that linger a little longer than others. So one, it doesn't, there's no time limit on it. There, it, it might, it's not like your friends are going to say, well, it's been three weeks. You should be feeling better. You're going to take the time that you take. There are other tools and things that you could do to help make sure it doesn't go on longer than it should. Because that means like if you stay in depression for a year and a half, you probably should be looking for a therapist. Um, if you're angry that long, you probably should be looking for some help. So the reason it's important to understand this this cycle is so that you understand what you're dealing with is not unusual. It's not unusual for you to be in a state of denial. It's not unusual for you to get angry or for you to want to bargain or for you to feel depressed or for you to get to a place where you can accept what has happened. All of those things are, are normal and it will help you get clarity if you can recognize and identify that you're in one of those stages of the loss cycle. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing when you're talking about pondering what happened is understand that people cope with things differently. We all have different coping mechanisms or different coping strategies. And it's good to be aware of what yours are to make sure that they're healthy coping strategies. So let's think some of the coping strategies. And if you think of some of your own, when you, when you, if you chime in to talk, remember what some of your coping strategies are. I can tell you right now, my mom's, one of her go-to coping strategies is take a nap. <laughs> It's taking that. We used to joke that our mom was a professional nap taker. If she's stressed out, if she is angry, whatever it is, she could just take a nap. Her thing is, I'm going to sleep on it and I'll see how I feel. And there's a powerful thing in that particular coping strategy, especially if you're emotionally uh, distraught. It just kind of lets you relax. You get your blood pressure down. You get your breathing. All that stuff can get regulated when you're sleeping and you can wake up with a clear head. So that's a powerful thing to be able to take a nap. For the rest of us, you may not be able to just fall asleep and there may be some other things you want to try. So obviously, or maybe not obviously, but one that a lot of people go to is working out. If that's something you do, whether it's a long walk or a trip to the gym or I keep things in my office. I have my weights in the floor. I have a hula hoop here. Um, I even play jacks. I think I've done it. I don't know if I've done it on this show. I've done some videos where I, I will sit in my floor or on my table and I, I literally have a ball with jacks and I will play jacks just to get my brain regulated again if something's going on. Um, if you're going through a breakup and you need a way to cope, you might try writing, reading, or journaling. Journaling is a powerful tool because it allows you to really put your thoughts on paper and have something to go back to. And there are so many journaling exercises that you can do specifically for getting through a difficult time. So those are things I would say, Google journaling exercises and see what some of the actual journaling exercises are that you can come up with. I, I have a couple that I, that I give to clients or recommend to clients, depending on what's going on with them. And I'm gonna talk about one of those a little bit later that you'll, you can do a journaling exercise. Um, you might use a creative outlet. For me, I might sit down and start sewing. Now, I do that when I'm happy too, but it's also something that's a go-to for me that I know is going to help me focus on something that is positive and constructive when I'm going through a really stressful period. So if you're going through a breakup right now, even if you're feeling like, I don't really feel like doing anything. I just want to stay in bed and curl up. And, and you may do that for a minute, but you cannot live in your bed so if you can get yourself up to do something creative that you really enjoy, that could be your one of your coping strategies. Now, you might want to have a glass or two of wine. And for most for most people under most circumstances, that's not a bad thing. I'm going to I'm going to give you this list and then I'm going to give you a caveat. And it's, it's fun. You guys hear me say this a lot. My mom used to tell me. <laughs> Because my mother was Dr. Phil before Dr. Phil, before I knew who Dr. Phil was. When he started talking, I realized she read some books. Um, everything that we can do that's positive, we, if we do it to an extreme, it has the, the ability to no longer be positive, you know? And so it's keep all of that in mind. So even the glass of wine, probably under most circumstances is not problematic. You can check with your doctor about that, but one glass of wine in the evening, maybe even two glasses of wine in the evening may not be an issue. The problem is when we take any of these things to excess, 
So um, chatting with your friends could be a great thing. It could be a good relief, a good release, right? Even if it's if it's not always positive, you know, sometimes we bond through complaining. And if you've just come out of a, a traumatic relationship, a difficult breakup, you might have some negative things to say, and you might have those one or two friends that you're able to talk to. And I'm going to come back to that because even that could be good for a moment, but you need to check that. You need to be paying attention to how often you're doing that. And I'll tell you why. Um, avoiding places where you could run into your ex, that might be a good way for you to cope in the, in the immediate time. If you can do that, you know, maybe you go to the same gym and maybe it's time for you to find another gym, or maybe you went to the gym at the same time and maybe you can shift your time so that you don't need to run into them. Um, Hey Wanda. So you don't need to run into them when you really aren't emotionally ready to run into them. So you might want to avoid some of those places, some other coping mechanism, spending time at church, spending a little more time at work, spending a little more time at the gym. So now let me go back and talk about how we can make these things that could be positive problematic. And you know what, Damali, I am so glad you were on here because Pastor Richardson at Christian Stronghold Church in Philadelphia, yes, I just gave them an entire plug because they they are so de- deserving of it. Pastor Richardson was the first pastor that I heard tell folks in his congregation, you can come here to church on Sunday. That gives you one service a week. You can be involved in one cell group, and that was a a prayer or a group that met at somebody's house to talk about scripture or whatever topics they were assigned. And you can be involved in two ministries. He said, that's it. That's it. And the reason was he didn't want people using the church as the excuse that they weren't having a life. Don't use the church as an excuse that you're not home with your family. Don't use the church as an excuse that you're not picking up your kids from school or you're not there for your wife or your husband and creating all this resentment toward the church with your family members or your partner or your spouse. And this is the same thing here. Be mindful that you are not using the church, the gym, staying at work late as a way to avoid dealing with the aftermath of this breakup. So you want to, you can't fix what you won't face. You can't fix what you won't face, right? And if you're in denial, you're not gonna be able to deal with what really happened. So in order for you to get clarity, you do want to give yourself some time to sit with what just happened. And you don't wanna overwhelm yourself. So if you need to, you can set a timer, set a timer and tell yourself, you know what? I'm gonna take a half an hour a day for the next two weeks. And for that 30 minutes, I'm gonna write or I'm gonna sit here and think about what really just happened for me. What was my experience? Hey, Faraz, what was this experience like for me? How did this relationship, why did this relationship come to an end? How do I feel about this relationship coming to an end? And so if you're gonna do that and get clarity, that means you gotta be careful how many glasses of wine you have because it could start off with one glass of wine in the evening just to kind of feel good and mellow. And then before you know it, there's a bottle missing. And so you can take any of these things, whether it's working out All of these things could become things that started off as positive ways to deal with this and they could turn into negative things if they become obsessions or if you become obsessive about them. And so make sure that you're not using these strategies as a way to avoid dealing with what actually happened. Um, And this one, like I said, it could be tough. So if you need to give yourself a time limit, set the clock and sit down and say, this is the 30 minutes that I'm going to give myself today to process. I want to also, you know, I'm always pulling some books out, right? I've mentioned Byron Katie before, but it was another book. This here is a great book. I need your love. Is that true? I need your love. Is that true? Just write it down. You can find her on Amazon. I think she even has this in the audio book. And this is just a really good way for you to examine what it is that you're trying to get out out of relationships. Are you chasing love? She says uh, how to stop seeking love, approval and appreciation and start finding those things instead. So she makes that distinction. Um, Her other book is Loving What Is. That was the first one of hers that I read, Loving What Is. And her name again is Byron Katie. And so this is a good one to kind of help you get a little grounded 
get clarity about what just happened to help. If you need some help trying to process what just happened, I highly, highly, highly recommend uh, uh, Byron Katie, Katie's book. So the second thing I want to talk about is getting together with friends and family. You know, what are some of the things that you can do with your friends, with your family so that you can just have some downtime time and be able to relax? And when we're talking about friends and family, you want to find the people that you can actually lean on and talk to. And they're not going to allow you to do the victim thing indefinitely. It's OK for you to feel bad. I just found a typo in my title. Don't worry about me. Stuff on the screen, chasing the shiny thing. It's OK for you to feel bad. It's OK for you to hurt and for you to be in pain. Um, I did a, a meme a few months ago and it was around people saying that their heart was broken after after a breakup. And I really believe if you're in pain after a breakup, ap after a divorce, after you end a relationship with someone that you loved, if your heart is aching, that to me is a sign that your heart isn't broken. It's supposed to hurt. I think broken hearts are the ones that don't feel anything anymore. That to me is what a broken heart is. But if your heart is actually aching after a relationship ends, after you lose someone you love, after something that you had had in your life for a period of time is now gone, I think it's supposed to ache and it's okay. Um, the, the challenge is we want to figure out how to heal after that heartache and how to mend that heart and how to move forward through that heartache and not get stuck in that place. And this is a good, a good place for part of your support team, which would be your friends and family to step in and for you to be able to have people that you can confide in, um, people that can tell you, okay, uh, enough of this for today. Let's do something fun. Cause I didn't listen to you for an hour now. The other reason you want to find people that don't let you stay stuck in that story is the longer you stay stuck in the story, the longer you get stay on that hamster wheel and you just keep cycling around in the negativity or something I posted yesterday, the swamp in your mind. If you are just swimming around in that swamp that you've created in your head, unfortunately, it can keep you emotionally in that same place. And the reason is your your brain doesn't know the difference between what's really happening and what you keep putting in it and what you keep thinking about. So if you continue to talk about it, that means you continue to think about it. And if you're constantly thinking about it, your brain is going to cause your body to respond like it's still happening. And so you literally have to get yourself into a place where you can stop that hamster thing happening in your head. And some of those coping strategies can be helpful and maybe listening to different music, changing your routine, like getting a hobby. Uh, one good thing that you can do that's almost an immediate thing is change the space that you are living in. So repaint your room, change the furniture around, like physically find some things that you can alter. And this is another place for friends and family to come in because you can invite them to come over and help you move your furniture around. Or you can call somebody like Wanda and see if she'll come over and build you something. <laughs> so I'm going to ask right now because I'm getting ready to go into number three. But if you're thinking about I want you to think about a relationship that you have been in and when you came out of it and what did you do to cope or what did you do that you now realize was not a good coping mechanism? It really did not serve you. Um, and you hopefully have learned from it. But I love for people to be able to share, yeah, things that worked. But sometimes we really can bless people when we can share some of the things that did not work. Like I highly wouldn't recommend getting out of one relationship and quickly jumping into another one. Um, or if you have that overlap, you really want to find some time to sit back and, and, and take a look at what you're doing and why to make sure you didn't jump out of the fire into the frying pan. Or is it out of the frying pan into the fire? You know what I meant. So if you're thinking about your own situation and a relationship, uh, transitioning out of a relationship, getting going through a breakup, how did you cope with it? What were your coping mechanisms? What did you do? to help yourself get clarity. And another one I, I didn't mention, and I don't know why, because I think I mentioned it every show, therapy, highly recommend it. Um, highly recommend therapy. I, I can't tell you enough. It, you, it could be therapy through your church, uh, whatever your faith is, a lot of religious organizations, you know, Christian uh, 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 facilities or churches or, or folks in that religion, 
often, and I say that because that's the one I'm familiar with and that I, I had studied at, matter of fact, at Damali's church years ago. Um, so you can find faith-based organizations that will have therapy uh, um, uh, services available to people. Um, you will also find, you know, some community-based services that are available for therapy or for counseling or for coaching. And I would tell you to make sure you look for somebody that actually has experience dealing with breakups and divorces and somebody who is solutions based. That, that means they're going to, um, I'm getting messages here. And am I still frozen for everybody? Somebody clap and let me know if you're, if I'm frozen for you. Cause one person says I'm frozen and I'm not seeing frozen on the screen. So let me see if anybody else, Nadine, it might just be you. Because I would tell you when mommy runs out here to tell me that I'm frozen and I'm not getting any signals that say I'm having technical issues. So maybe it's something technical on your end. I'm going to keep going because I don't see anybody else saying that there's a problem. Um, so look for somebody who specifically works with breakups and divorces because it is a little different and look for somebody who is also solutions focused. In other words, they are going to give you uh, they're going to hear what's going on. They're going to talk to you about action steps. They're going to leave you with action steps because I want my clients to leave every one of our sessions with things that they can actually do. So if I talk to them about the tools that, that will help you move through or get deeper clarity or to help you take uh, control back in your life or to help you be more responsible in your life or to help you focus on what, any of those things that I want my client to be able to do for, for themselves. If I give them tools, I'm going to explain to them why I'm giving them that tool, what that tool is designed to do. And then we're going to figure out together what are some of the action steps you can do after our session to move you forward. So if you look for a coach or a therapist, ask those questions and find out how they're going to actually help you move forward. Cause what you don't want to do is go to somebody for a year and you're basically just sitting there talking about your problems all the time. And you don't have any tools or techniques to, to change your situation and you're paying, you know, whatever you're paying a, a visit for that to happen. So friends and family, uh, at this point, really good to have those folks to lean on, to bounce those ideas off of and make sure they are your friends and family that are not going to, keep you in a toxic environment. You want the ones that are going to lift you up, support you in moving forward. Okay. Number three, do a positive, a positive personal inventory, a positive personal inventory. And I talked about this a couple of weeks ago in my hot tub talks. We are often really, really good at picking out the things that we don't necessarily do well or the things that we don't like about ourselves. And unfortunately, sometimes we are surrounded with people who will help us do that. <laughs> They're very good at telling us the things that we don't do well or the things that they don't like. Take a that's a that's a, <laughs> that's a whole nother that's a whole nother show. But I want you to be really intentional about picking out positive personal attributes about yourself. Now there's a thing called a VIA. It's a character assessment. You can go to VIA.org, I believe, and take this and it will help you find your positive character traits. Um, and it's a book, positive virtues. It's a beautiful thing to know because you get to see how accurate this thing feels for you, but it just gives you good things that you can lean into. But I want you to take a piece of paper. This is your, your journaling exercise. And I want you to write down the things about yourself that are positive. What are the things about you that you're proud of? What are the things that you've accomplished that you are proud of? What are the things about you that other people tell you they admire? Like when you show up, they're happy you're there because why? Uh, you just bring the sunshine in the room. You're gonna bring laughter into the space. What are the attributes? And there is no such thing as this list being too long. You can make this list as long as you want it. Matter of fact, start the list, whatever you don't finish, spend 10, 15 minutes and leave it there. And then tomorrow and the next day, every time you think of something or as you want, want to add something, because maybe you learned to do something tomorrow that you couldn't do yesterday. And now you can add that, write those things down and put them on the list. Let me tell you why this is, why this is important. Like I said, it's really easy for us to find out problems and that's not unusual. 
Um, if you're somebody who likes to find solutions, the only way you can find a solution is to know what the problem is. If you're going to fix something, you have to know what's broken or what's out of order. And we do that with a lot of other things and people, but we do it with ourselves all the time, too. And so in order to counter that, especially after going through a breakup where your confidence may be down, um, your self-esteem may not be at, at its peak, and that's all perfectly fine and normal, and it's not anything you need to beat yourself up over, I want to give you a tool right now to help you counter that. And that's this positive personal inventory list. So what are the things about you that you like the things that other people have told you. And you can even, this is another thing, you can go back to those friends and family and even coworkers and say, hey, I'm doing this personal inventory that this woman on the podcast you know, recommended. Tell me one thing about me that you like. And people will tell you what it is. So this is a really easy way to help you build your list. So you could be, you know, tall, dark and handsome and short, stout and, and fine or however you want to describe yourself but figure out what those attributes are that and, and look at yourself. Do the physical one, too. You can add the physical things. You love your brown eyes or you love the way your your hair looks when you take your cap off in the morning. Whatever those things are, write them down. The point of this is, is to remind yourself and to have a, a way of reminding yourself of your positive attributes now. Some folks are going to have a problem with this because you have a negative loop running in your head constantly, especially if you if you had a little loop running before the breakup, the loop may have gotten longer and bigger since the breakup. So I got another book for you. Hold on here. This one. This is the book session. I hope y'all are writing this down. And for those of you who are not uh, watching this, if you're looking at listening to this on a stream service, I'll tell you the names of the books. This one is by Dr. Shad Helmstetter, Dr. Sham Helmstetter, but the book is called What to Say Talk to Yourself, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself. This book, um, I'm not going to say it's one of my favorites because I, I have so many favorites. It just depends on what was going on at the time when I got it. I just feel like God gives me the right book at the right time. So at that moment, it is my favorite book. But what I really like about this book, one, he gives you some case studies in here so you can understand the power that we have over what's going on in our head. There is also an app that you can get called Self Talk, Self Talk. I have this app on my phone and almost every single morning I am listening to something from that app. And without you realizing it, it just starts putting you in a different frame of mind. So if you are already thinking, huh, positive personal inventory, this is going to be hard. And you really feel like I'm, I just can't think of anything. That means you may have a negative loop running in your head already and you struggle with finding positive things to say about yourself. Now, I'm, I'm not a psychotherapist. And I will say this could come from a lot of stuff. If you grew up in a home where you didn't really get complimented, um, if you were in a relationship for a long time where you weren't told how, how decent of a person you were or you weren't used to hearing attributes, if you grew up thinking that um, even talking about the good things about yourself meant you weren't humble, it could have had people could have had really good intentions around that. They didn't want you to sound conceited or whatever. Um, and it, it might not have had the right outcome for you because we should be able to identify positive things about ourselves. Because if we're made in God's image, God knows there's some good stuff working, working in us. And if you can identify it, you're more likely to be able to demonstrate it. Right. But if you can't even identify it, it might be because you got a lot of negative self-talk. And this this is something that can help you with that. So this is going to be one of my add ons here is to, to look for this book. So four, I want you to listen to your feelings about whether or not you should continue to have contact with your ex. Now, I was doing I was doing some reading on this beforehand, and I don't always agree with all of the other experts out here. And because I do work with people who have been in abusive situations and I know how difficult a breakup can be. I'm going to just put this to you, to you as the audience. Somebody out here tell me, how likely is it that you were in a relationship that breaks up because it's not working, that tomorrow you're going to turn around and be, be best friends? You're, you're going to develop a friendship right after this relationship ends. <laughs> and if you met someone who told you that that happened, 
how believable is that for you? Let me see what, what Monica has going on here. Hey, Monica. Hey, my darling. Now, you know what? You, you just should have just absolutely put my name on that question. Because what in the tarnation would make anybody think that if I broke up because it was some serious issues going on, goodbye, God bless you, bless and release, let me heal and get real. Bless the release and let me heal and get real and goodbye. Because sometimes people use that friendship thing. I'm telling you, Lisa, it pisses me off so bad. But they use that friendship thing to keep the little toe in the water to see if the possibilities get healed. And if I see you got it together, then we're going to get back together. But if you don't get together, goodbye. Let me see. Goodbye. Anybody else think, Monica, I, I read this. And when I was looking up information for these different points, when I saw this one, I almost didn't even read it. I almost didn't even give it to girl. But I, because I just struggle with this, I think a lot of people, and very much, you know, in alignment with what you just said, I think for a lot of people, there's a difference between having to have what I will will, will refer to as um, what did I put down a friendly friendly. Uh, friendly contact or friendly communication. Mm -hmm. And for people that have children, they'll know what I'm talking about. If you work with your ex and you're sure. going to keep working with your ex, you need to develop some sort of friendly relationship so that you can have a cordial uh, way to communicate. That, that to me is different than um, deciding, do you want to meet them for lunch? I mean, Lisa, I mean, you're absolutely right. But see, what about these these people that are codependent? Right. That's see, that's not a good that is not a good situation. No, that's my. That's you know what I'm point. saying? When you don't have to have communication with them, and and I I would tell you, Monica, I even am more likely to coach someone for a period of time, even if you have children. And it doesn't have to be your attorney. Here's here's Wanda. It doesn't have to be your attorney. It might be another family member. Let them be your communication in between. Absolutely. And and so mainly for your own. And I'm going to say as a woman, I'm speaking from for from for me, for my own psychological well being. I yeah. don't know that I want to be in communication with you because I need to get emotionally detached. And in order absolutely, to yeah. So we're yep. the same. Wanda, what are you, what are you thinking? Thanks, Monica. Well, I'm going back years ago. Remember, I told you about that one that was pretty bad, and his uh, psychiatrist wanted me to come into their meeting. Oh, and yeah, and the reason was that so she could scream. No, it, the reason that they gave me was that um, he wouldn't get any better until he could confront me. And what was said in the, the one and only time I went was, I would feel better if I could punch you in the face. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what he said. Okay, and now, so this just supports my point, the several that I'm about to make. Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, Wanda. Wait a minute. No, he didn't. Did he say that for real, Wanda? He didn't. Wanda. The only thing that would make him feel better Wanda, is if he could punch me in my face. And you know what I would have done? I'd have punched him in his damn face and sat there and be like, come on, sucker. Come on. I knew you were going to unmute Monica. Yes. But you know what? And I want to say this. God bless you. Who are my men? Charlie, thank you for being here. For Rise, thank you for being here. And I'm glad you're here to hear this because a lot of times men aren't privy to this stuff. They don't realize that these are the things that women hear and that we go through. And believe me, I grew up in a house full of women. I know the crazy stuff we can do in a relationship. I didn't see it. Oh, yeah. I didn't see it and going, oh, my gosh, I shouldn't have seen that. However, having said that, that right there is a form of abuse for me from the th yeah. because they they should yeah. have known better. There is it is not yeah. your job to be the buffer and the, the, the psychological lifeline for somebody who has just traumatized and abused you. Mm -hmm. It's just not it's not your job. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the same yeah. person who had tapped my phones. Remember that. Right. So now they bring me in there. 
and believe me, it was the one and only time. Mm-hmm. It never happened again. <laughs> that, that, that's a testament to your youth at the time. Uh huh. Want to trust a, a uh huh? Telling you this is going to be helpful and be beneficial. Yeah. If he can just do this, he'll have closure. Mm. Yes. Not, not your job. So now that we've gotten that out, let me tell you what I really think about this. After you break up, these are some things that I really think would benefit you. One, block them on every bit of social media you have. Every one of them. Don't miss anything. Block them on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn. All of them. Chat, chat. A to the man. A to the and And it's not because you're Petty LaBelle or Petty Pendergrass. Uh, it's neither one of those. It's because right now, your one job, you got one job. <laughs> your one job is maintaining a mental state of mind that allows you to focus on getting your life back on track and you learning to love, appreciate, and respect you. And if you aren't going to be able to do that because every doggone morning iPhone wants to give you a a video stream of two years ago and it happens to be all of your ex, because I swear to goodness, the last time I ended a relationship, it seemed like every morning this daggone phone could only find videos uh, streaming pictures together and making little music videos for me of me with my ex. And I was like, how is this even happening? So after you block them everywhere, Go through your photographs. Go through your photographs and delete them. Because if you're if you're sitting around rolling through your pictures, going, "Oh my gosh, when we went to the park. Oh, you remember when we went to Grand Canyon? Oh my God, Paris." You can go back to all of those places on your own or with somebody else, with a girlfriend or whatever, your aunt, your sister. But you either need to take all those pictures and delete them or move them into a file and put them somewhere else. Now, I, I have a caveat for people to a caveat that if you have children, put them in a file somewhere. Put those pictures in a file and save them for your kids later. They do not need to be on your device popping up for you all the time. And again, this is not about being petty or catty or mean. And, it, and don't let anybody tell you, well, if you were really over him or her, if you were really strong enough, it wouldn't matter. Cocky pop, bull crap, bull shiggity, all, yeah, here, this right here. I'm not trying to hear that. Do what you need to do. And that's what the right thing is for you. You don't have to agree to coffee dates or lunches or face to face meetings to talk about whatever. You can get somebody to be your 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 communicator, your your mediator, your intermediator. Inter, inter, what am I? Word am I trying to say? Yeah, your mediator, and speak on your behalf to them. You can write them. Uh, you can write letters or send them an email and communicate that way. But if you know that somehow you're going to be triggered in a really bad way by t- having to deal with them, then figure that out. And if you have a therapist that you've been seeing together, most therapists, and I'm not a therapist, I'm a coach. There's a difference. Most therapists, if they've been seeing you as a couple, will not see you. Um, Wanda, you're still on. They will not see you individually. They they may see one of you and then the other one has to find someplace else to go if they're going for therapy individually. But if you're breaking up, Make sure you let your therapist know that the relationship is over and you guys have been coming together and what's going to be the best way for you to continue going to therapy. Do you need to find another therapy or will they? Can they recommend somebody? You want to sever as much unnecessary communication with this person as you can. And don't get yourself caught up in this foolishness of thinking there's something wrong with you or that you're weak because you need to do this right now. And there's no time limit. There's no moratorium on how long this could last. If you don't have children with this person, um, I I had someone once say to me, well, I want to be, I I just want to be friends with my ex. And I said, why? Well, they're a really nice person and they can still be a nice person, but what's this friendship about? Cause see my, I contend that if they can be friends with their ex, that means their ex can be friends with me. If we can't be friends with your ex, then your friend, your ex is like Monica was saying, Your ex really isn't trying to be your friend. They're trying to keep a foot in the door. So Monica, the way I describe that is that's the that's the friend that is waiting for you to get hit by a low flying plane so they could come in and swoop them up while they're mourning. (laughs) So real. Yeah. If if they're friends, then I should know that. And and as and a lot of times I've talked to women and they know when they meet a female friend of the guy they're dating, if she feels like she's a friend 
or she feels like she wants to be more than a friend. And I would think some men have that same spidey sense. Um, so monitor that for yourself. And, and my point there would be just listen to yourself. And if you are telling yourself, well, I should be able to be friends with them because they are nice and I should want to be able to go to lunch. I, if I'm strong enough and over it, then it's not a problem because depending on the person you are with, they may be trying to convince you of that foolishness too. Well, I don't know why we can't have coffee. If it's over and you don't have no feelings for me, it shouldn't be a problem. Don't fall for the okie doke. If that is surfacing, I want you to take a minute and check your own feelings and figure out what's really coming up. Be honest with yourself. Are you thinking, well, if I just have sex with him, everything will be, or well, if I can just be around him, maybe he'll see. You may still be in the bargaining phase of your law cycle. And in that bargaining phase, you may put yourself in some stupid situations thinking it's going to save a relationship that's actually already over. So pull back. Get your clarity, write your positive list of who you are. And another list you can write is these are two lists. I gave this in my hot top talk a few weeks ago, too. These are two different lists. The first list is all the stuff that happened in that relationship that you did not like, which is all the reasons you're not with that person. Even if they broke up with you, something wasn't going right in that relationship. And you probably felt it even if you were in denial. So now's the time to wake yourself up, ask your friends, because you probably told them when there were problems and now you forgot. Write all the stuff that wasn't working because that helps you stay in the present. It helps you stay focused on the what is. And then write your, your dream list. Write the list of what you want from a partner. So if you weren't getting good communication, healthy communication, you know you want healthy communication. If you were getting sex with no intimacy or affection, just sex, and you want intimacy and affection, sometimes the way you can learn what you do want is to identify the things that you didn't like. It's like, well, I didn't like this. Instead of this, I would really rather have this. And that will help you create that list. And now you can pull that list out when somebody's talking about let's do coffee and you go, mm, these are all the reasons I don't want coffee with you. And these are all the things that I want and you're not on that list. So that's a no. If it's not an emphatic yes, it's a no. And no is a complete sentence. So that's it. That one kind of got me a little bit. But I'm thank you, Monica and Wanda, for coming in on that. And Wanda, Wanda, I, you are not the first person this week talking to me about phone lines being tapped. I'm just blown away. And Monica is a private investigator, so she knows about phone tapping. But it's just it's just crazy to me the lengths that people will go through to continue to get on your nerves. So the fifth thing that you can do to help you get over a breakup is try something new. Just get out of your own head. Get out of your own, I'm going to say, comfort zone. I really don't. I don't prefer the get out of your comfort zone. I prefer enlarge it, just enlarge it. I don't do half full, half empty. I think we are the vessel. And when you are the vessel, you trust that God or whomever it is you look to will enlarge you so that you can hold anything that's being poured into you. So figure out how to expand your comfort zone, enlarge your vessel by learning and trying new things. And you may do some things and realize I learned that I hate that. And that's okay because at least now you know you don't like it. So maybe you try to paint a room and you don't like painting a room. So you hire somebody to, to paint the room. But then you find out that you like laying flooring. And so you do your own flooring. Or maybe you just would rather go pick out drapes and do the finishing things. Figure out some things that you can do that are new for you and try them. And it could be some other things. A long time ago on my show, I talked, I did a whole show, I think, on volunteering. This is a great time to volunteer. You could volunteer at a child's mentoring program where you get to read to children or you mentor kids and some things that you're really gifted in. You can volunteer at a local senior citizens center, excuse me, where they need people to come in and support their staff. Um, you can volunteer at your soup kitchen, at a Goodwill facility, at uh, sometimes at elementary schools. I knew people that used to volunteer to hold babies at the hospital. Uh, babies who have been born, you know, drug addicted or their mothers, you know, they were they were left there. They didn't have anybody to come in and, and just hold them. There are so many things you can do to volunteer to kind of get yourself out of your own head. It just feels good when you're doing something for other people to remind you. And then you can go back and put this on your list on your your my personal inventory list. You can go and add these things to your inventory list. Take a class. 
Have you always wanted to learn to play the piano, the flute or salsa lessons? Uh, Join some local club. Are you interested in crocheting, knitting, biking? There's whatever it is, there is probably a club for it. And depending on what it is now, there's probably a club online for it. So you, you don't even have to leave home to participate in it. You can learn a new skill. Uh, Wanda, and y'all think I'm joking, but Wanda literally makes furniture. You guys have seen me make stuff, but uh, Wanda, I, I'm pretty sure Wanda could build a house. I could help her put some pieces in it, but she could probably build pretty much the house. Um, stained glass, jewelry making. I had someone on a call yesterday say that they they had this time now that they were broken up and their ex would pick up the kids. And at first it was a problem because they just felt more alone with the children out of the house. And so we, we do this thing called think of one good thing. I actually posted a hot tub talk today. Think of just one or last night. Think of one good thing that has come from this relationship being over. And for a lot of people, this can be a struggle because when it first happens, you're just in that state of all that you are missing, what you have lost, what is coming to an end. Even if you don't feel like the relationship was healthy, it's really easy to hang on to what you're missing. But if you can think of one good thing. So this woman finally thought, you know what? Um, now that the baby's gone, because her, her, one of her children was young. Now that the baby's gone, I can get some sleep while the baby's not here. I don't have to worry about the kid waking me up. So she started taking naps. And then she decided, hmm, I have a little more time. I'm going to pull my jewelry making kit back out during this time when the kids are with their dad. So she took her jewelry kit out and started making jewelry and started selling jewelry on the internet. So just by her thinking of one good thing that she could do or one good thing that came from this breakup, she started an online jewelry business that's doing really well. So think of just that one good thing and you don't know what could come from you not harping on the negatives and intentionally thinking about one good thing that could come from this relationship. And it, if it's time that you could spend you now have all these different things that you can think about doing with that time. Hey, mom. Hey, babe. Can you hey, hear mom. me? Yep, I hear you. Oh, okay. I was going to say another thing. Um, when we are anxious, angry, um, when we, our emotions have gotten the best of us, so to speak, mm -hmm. it harms your body. Okay? It, it starts to harm your body. Um, high blood pressure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, your brain releases uh, chemicals that over time can be harmful to the body. Right. So these people who stay in, for whatever reason, stay in a state of uh, depression, anger. I think mm -hmm. anger is a big yeah, one. A big uh, often one. when people break up, we know people who have been angry for years yep. over a breakup. They died angry. And now they're complaining of their joints aching. Um, just all kinds of things. And for yeah. men, um, are our men still here? Yeah, for men, yeah, it seems to be uh, for men who are angry over a long period of time, the rate of heart attacks increases one and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, they didn't put an age on that. Right. They're just talking about what these chemicals are doing to your body over a long period of time. Yes. It's the same thing for people who are hostile. Mm -hmm. People, you know, people who just seem to live in hostility, you know. Yep. Um, so, yeah, just things to, to think about. And it's, it's true of the opposite. People who laugh a lot have less physical illness, Ill, illnesses. They live longer. Um it's and that's just the way our, we can't separate our brain right. from what's brain going on know. in our body. Yeah, your brain doesn't know the difference. So if you right. create a reality in your brain that affects the chemical reactions in your body, you know, right. say smiling changes the chemicals. It causes right. a different reaction. So it actually helps you to get happier. Even if you are putting a fake smile on, if you do that for a couple of minutes, there are changes that happen in your body. If you can change what you're thinking about. And moving on. So just I, I want to roll this into ways that, to help you move on. So my mom was just talking about all of these physical things that can happen from you. So if we go back to talking about that loss cycle. If you get stuck in anger, 
Um, if you get stuck in depression, and I want to, I want to preface the depression conversation around. I'm not talking about clinical depression. While that could happen long term, like I said, if you end up depressed for a year, year and a half, you probably need to be going to see a therapist. But if you're depressed and it's kind of coming and going, and you know it's a result of the breakup, and you're trying to move through it. That's the kind of uh, thing you want to take action and you want to start figuring out what are some things that you can do to change the behavior to get yourself out of that state. So if you find that early in the morning when you have your cup of coffee, you start feeling depressed and you string it back to, wait a minute, because I used to get up and have a cup of coffee with my ex every morning at this time and this was the mug that I always used, then a couple of things, change the mug. You might even change your coffee brand so you don't even have the same taste. But those are little things that you can do that people don't often think of that can change your mood because it doesn't take you into that depressed state. But mom, thanks for reminding people. See, this is why it's good to have nurses around you. Um, and I have a kinesiologist on here who's quiet right now to probably tell us some more things that you could do to um, move out of some of these states. But it's good to understand we sometimes attribute these health issues to a lot of things and we may say, oh, it might be stress, but we don't back, we don't walk it back and, and actually pinpoint where the stress is coming from. And a breakup and a divorce, like I said at the top of this, they are number two in terms of stress only behind the death of a spouse. The death of a spouse is the only thing that, and I've got my mom on here who's been through too. Actually, I'm gonna ask you why we have you here. You've gone through both death of a spouse and and some breakups, right? Right. For yeah. You, emotionally, what 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 was the difference going through that loss cycle or that grieving cycle? Do you remember? Well, I think yeah, I think um, you know the the death of anyone, uh, whether they're five or one hundred and five, if it's someone that you love, um, it's very difficult. I I felt like I had time to prepare for my husband's death because it was a result of illness. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively long-term illness, but not, you know, not, well, but I, I was not prepared. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, although you know it's coming, you're just never as prepared as you, or at least I wasn't as prepared as I thought I was. And I would often think about you guys, think about my daughters and how much you guys were missing them. And it was like, okay, well, we're all missing him together. So um, what would he want us to do? And he would want us to have a good time and laugh. And that's what we did. And to this day, we still talk about him and laugh. That's right. Um, yeah. You know, so, so those are the kind of memories that, that I, I share with, with anybody about, about my husband. Yeah. You know, about all the good times and the laughter and the stupid stuff that we did and you know, and, and all that. So that kind of helped me. Yeah, I think that's, you know, and it, I've heard people say that, that deaths are some, they, they feel like death might be easier because you know the person is gone. Whereas a yeah. breakup or a divorce, you still might have to deal with this person and run into them and it may not be pleasant. And so there, there are kind of different ways to look at this. But one of the things that, that you shared, and I'm, I'm going to wrap up here in a minute, is the choice, the choice of how you view it. And so with my dad passing, yeah, at some point we, we can be on vacation and just sitting around laughing and talking about things my dad would have said or done. One, I think it keeps the person with you forever. Their spirit is always kind of right. alive with us. But it, it's a testament to the fact that we are the masters of the choices in our life. And right. we can choose to be depressed and distraught over a, losing a loved one. We can choose to be stuck and depressed and sad over a relationship ending or we can do the things that I talked about today and that's get clarity and get a grip on what happened and how do you move yourself beyond that and what part did you play in it so the next relationship you can do something different. Um, make sure that you are using coping strategies that are effective, that are beneficial and that long term are still going to bless you and be, be good for you and healthy for you, not something that if you continue down that path, it could become a problem. Make sure you have some friends and family that you can confide in and lean on. Uh, when I talk to folks about a support group, it includes, usually if it's a divorce, it includes an attorney and a finance person, but then it goes into your friends and family, that local support, some kind of fitness buddy or somebody that's gonna help you stay active. 
and something that uh, somebody like me, like a coach, that's going to coach you because that's different than than a therapist, even if you have a therapist. So those are, could be a part of your support. And then do that positive list for yourself. Do your positive in your positive personal inventory and see what you come up with because it's going to make you feel good. And today I threw in what's the list of stuff you didn't like in the relationship and the stuff that you want in the next relationship so that you have something to actually look at when your brain is thinking, I think I want to go to lunch with my ex. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't. You don't. <laughs> Monica, don't make Monica come looking for you um, to go to lunch with your ex. I actually had one a year and a half, two years afterwards, call me out of the blue and say, I'm going to be in the area. Do you want to have coffee? Mm, not drinking. No, no coffee for me. Not doing that. You are the masters of the choices you make and you actually control that dial that's going on in your head. You can contr- control your brain and you just have to be aware of it. This is all part of that healing process. If you've had a breakup or divorce, you don't have to go through it alone. Reach out for the help that you need and trust yourself to be able to move through this and not get stuck in it. This is going to be another story that you have in your life that could be a powerful testimony for somebody else. And I'll leave you with something I learned from Lisa Nichols. She said, make sure that you get to a place where you can stand on your story and not be stuck in your story. Is my mom back on here? Um, I just wanted to, real quick, (laughs) I wanted to know the difference between a coach and a therapist. The difference. Okay. So a therapist is typically somebody that's licensed medically. Um, So it could be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a social worker who's got a certification and they may take you into your past. You may end up talking about your childhood. They may help you connect the dots to why you're, you've been angry at your dad or your mom for the last 35 years or, or piece those things together. Those things may come up with me as a coach But primarily as a coach, I want to help you go from wherever you are to where you're trying to get to. And so some people may have both because they may be dealing with some things from their past that they haven't resolved. And they can I tell folks, if that's the case, let your therapist know that you're working with a coach because we do typically do different things. The other thing with me as a coach, like I said, is I am focusing on helping you move forward and I'm doing it, giving you actual action steps. So you have something to do. And some therapists do that and some don't. I was actually on a call with one this morning who said she knows she's a little unusual because she knows a lot of other therapists that don't necessarily do action steps. They're kind of listening and they want you to resolve things from your past and heal from past hurts and those sorts of things. And and those are great and necessary. And it's also necessary that you be able to deal with where you are now and be able to move forward. And so that would be the primary difference. And, you know, then we can talk about uh, mentors and, and the difference between a mentor. But for a therapist or even a psychiatrist and the other thing with psychiatrists, they can administer medication. So that would be one thing that makes them different. Um, and I'm going to ask if Damali is on here, if I missed anything on there with the therapy psych thing, because for some reason I have a feeling she might know something about that. Um, but those would be the primary differences. Wanda, you can you can have both. And if it's not you dealing with a bunch of stuff from your past, you're trying to deal with where you are now and move forward, you just feel stuck, then a coach may be a really good thing. And that's why for me, dealing with people that are going through a breakup, going have gone through a divorce, or maybe even in the process, having a coach is really, really powerful and beneficial because we can actually help with things like um, you're going through your legal battle and you're really stressed out. Uh, you're having difficulties dealing with work. A coach can help you work through these tools so that you can go to work with a clearer frame of mind and it's not so uh, disruptive of the rest of your life, that we help you take control and take responsibility over what's going on in your life as a result of this breakup or divorce so that you can live your life and still move through it. So I like to believe we, uh, the coaching that I offer actually helps people move through these things with a lot more confidence because they have the right kind of support and they're learning tools that they can use for the rest of their lives. Thanks for that question. I see Damali giving me a thumbs up. So thank you. So everybody, look, um, you'll see a ticker tape on my little fortune cookie at the bottom. My book is out. Well, I'm sorry. Let me correct myself. My book is not out. My book is in pre-order. You can now pre-order Divorce is Not a Destination on Amazon. Divorce is not a destination. It's on Amazon. If you use the link, you can pre-order it starting now. Tell your friends, tell your family, buy one as a gift, send one to your friends. 
Um, and it's for people who have gone through a breakup or a divorce. And it's also for some folks who maybe haven't gotten married because I think they have a lot to learn from folks who have already been through breakups and divorces so that they can kind of get themselves together before they get into a relationship. So I wanted to share that with you. And then the next four weeks, we are going to be talking about narcissism. We, I'm going to do a four-part series on exploring narcissism, and we're going to start that next week. So hope to see you back here next week. In the meantime, God bless you all. Thank you for joining me tonight. Love having you here, and I will see you next Thursday. Bye. Thank you for listening to Divorce Is Not A Destination. Please recommend the show to friends and family. You can join my live audience and see upcoming shows by registering for access at firesidechat.com forward slash Lisa Summer Hour. Connect with me on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram at Divorce Is Not A Destination. And catch replays here on Fireside, my YouTube channel, or your favorite streaming service. Until next time, remember, I'm here to help you get unstuck, gain confidence, and thrive beyond your breakup or divorce. Because divorce is not a destination.